Check, check. All right. Welcome to Terrapin Crossroads 1975. All right. So um, we're going to start off with, uh, like every year in the Billboard Top 10, there was the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so while the Grateful Dead were being mad scientists trying to create blues for Allah, this is what was in the Billboard Top 10. <laughs> Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds by Elton John. Mandy by Barry Manilow. <laughs> Blues for Allah, Mandy, Blues for Allah. Uh, You're No Good by Linda Ronstadt. Black Water by the Doobie Brothers. Doobie Brothers, my first concert in 1975. Shining Star by Earth, Wind & Fire. Sister Golden Hair, America. Love Will Keep Us Together, Captain and Tennille. <laughs> Jive Talking by the Bee Gees. Get Down Tonight by Casey and the Sunshine Band. And Island Girl by Elton John. Those are just a few of them, but as you can see, disco was coming on. It wouldn't be long before the Grateful Dead started to explore some disco. Uh, some, of the, some of the great films that came out in 1975, Dog Day Afternoon with Al Pacino. Jaws by Steven Spielberg. Uh, Monte Python and the Holy Grail was in yeah. the film. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Uh, the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And uh, Tommy featuring The Who. Yeah. So um, in, in Grateful Dead Land, um, 75 was an odd year as we know. Uh, by the time 75 actually started, they were already two months into what would become a 20-month hiatus. Um, I think a lot of fans were wondering if the Grateful Dead would ever get back together. Um, so was I. <laughs> and uh, uh, it was the end of 75 where um, Garcia was trying to finish a solo record, Reflections, and he was working on Might as well. And his band that he had put together sort of was crumbling and he brought in the Grateful Dead to help finish that record. So that was sort of the beginning of, of uh, the changeover when they started to realize that um, maybe they wanted to keep making music and that was the way to go as the Thank Grateful you. Dead. So, but, but backing up a little bit, um, they built a new studio above Bob Weir's garage, and uh, and that's where they recorded uh, Blues for All. A guy named Stephen Barncard built that studio, and uh, Robbie Taylor, who many of you know, helped Barncard build that wow. space. Um, I think Robbie was soldering everything together for him. He was a, he was a jeweler, so Robbie was the master solder. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that, that soundboard that they had in Weir's studio was custom built because I guess the room was like a triangle shape, and so they couldn't just buy a soundboard. They actually had to custom build it. So, uh, again, also um, in Grateful Dead fashion, um, they had not road tested any of those songs that were going to be on Blues for All. They had never played any of them live. They created that whole entire record in the studio, in this small space. And so, Phil, tell us just a little bit about working in that small space and above Weir Studio, no pressures from record companies or anything like that. It was, it was, kind of, it was very cool, but it wasn't. It, it, it was for such a small room. It what it didn't seem crowded or cramped at all. Um, and uh, and, it, and it's actually contrary to Grateful Dead practice to to go into the studio with no material at all. I mean, most of the time we had road tested. Everything uh, that, that got written, as, I mean, as soon as it got written, we, you know, we worked it up and then went right into the rotation in the, in the live shows because that's what we did most of, obviously. And uh, but it was it was really kind of a kind of a cool, intimate experience recording in in their lifetime where we uh, we we all played together. We, we didn't uh, you know, like just play down a, a drum and bass track and then overdub to it. So, and you know, as cramped as it was, it was it was really pretty fun and. Uh, it was, uh, the, the material just sort of sort of coalesced. I think Jerry and Bob had a couple of sketches of songs, maybe Help on the Way, Franklin's Tower, and uh, Music Never Stopped. And, but it, and, we, uh, and we just went from there, and, uh, just expanding all that stuff. And uh, it, uh, it was really, a, I remember it being a lot of fun. And, uh, uh, but uh, I, th I don't think we could I don't think we mixed down. No, we did. Yeah, we mixed everything down. I think we mixed everything down somewhere else. I know Healy was uh, engineering in the studio with you guys. Yeah. So I don't know who mastered or did the final mix on yeah. it. Yeah, and I, I still re I still remember uh, remember um, mastering uh, or, or mixing uh, King Solomon's Marbles, the instrumental that I had for that for that record. <laughs> 
walking out. It was the last thing to get mixed. I walked out the door and got on a plane and went to Florida to see, a, to see the last uh, Apollo launch. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, soy as it was. So that, that's, a, that's, my, that's my main memory. <laughs> So, um, so as you know, 1975, um, there were only four Grateful Dead concerts, and they were all very, very unique in their own way. So the first one was uh, in March of 1975, and it was at Kizar, which was a, a high school track and field right at right, uh, the beginning of Golden Gate Park. And, uh, the 49ers actually used to play. Yes, of course, right, 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 yes. Um, and, uh, in true Grateful Dead fashion, so it was, a, it was a benefit that Bill Graham put together called the Snack Benefit, and it was to benefit all the schools, and it was Bob Dylan. Students Dillon. need a, a athletic culture and kicks. <laughs> uh, Marlon Brando was there, and uh, but anyway, so so this is what the Grateful Dead come out and play in a stadium show. They come out and they play Blues for Allah, Stronger Than Dirt, Drums, Stronger Than Dirt, Blues for Allah. <laughs> And then Johnny Be Good, so they had to get the fans up. Like, what, you know, interesting show, and I'm sure everybody was like, what? <laughs> and then, um, so the next show that they did was in June of 75, so that was March of 75, and that was a benefit for a post artist named Bob Freed. It was the Bob Freed Memorial Boogie, and that was actually um, uh, listed as the Jerry Garcia band, or Jerry Garcia and Friends, but it turned out to be the entire Grateful Dead. And uh, also Kingfish played, Keith and Donna, and that was like more of a real show, and they were playing more of Blues for Allah. They played Crazy Fingers, and they played Help Out in the Way, Slip, Franklin's, uh, uh, Blues for Allah, Stronger Than Dirt, blah, blah, blah. Um, it was the first, it was the first, uh, blah, blah. Okay. They, they played Sugar Mag and U.S. Blues, but that was the first Crazy Fingers that they played. It was the first Franklin's, it was the first Help on the Way. And it, on, on the databases, it's listed as Help on the Way as being completely instrumental. I don't know if you remember that. So, uh, so uh, um, did they, anybody? Did somebody let some crickets in a box out or something? <laughs> um, so then the next show was in August of '75, and I'm sure it's no surprise um, what that one was. But that was the Great American Music Hall show, and that was a record release party, um, and. Uh, from what we all understand, it was like an industry event, and you know, you've all been to the Great American Music Hall, or many of you have been if you live here, and you know it's this incredible, beautiful room. It was a brothel a hundred years ago. It's got a, a sort of that night it was full of suits, <laughs> and uh, they were trying to they were trying to convince people of something, and uh, and of course that record was the record release party, so they played you know pretty much everything on the record, the other one, and some other great things. And then the last show of 75 was a free concert in Golden Gate Park in Lindley Meadow, which is um, the one over from Speedway Meadow. Part of Hardly Strictly Bluegrass happens now in Lindley Meadow. Um, and uh, it was with the Jefferson Starship, and it's a legendary show. And again, it was also, you know, help, slip, you know, music never stopped. Franklin's came later on in the set. Truck in the 11, Stronger Than Dirt, Not Fade Away, going down the road. Another amazing, amazing show with a lot of people. People were really, you know, dying to see the Grateful Dead. And as we talked about before, you know, I think it was the end of the year and they got back together with Garcia to finish that record that they really started to realize that they really missed the Grateful Dead. And that was really where their hearts were at. I missed it the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, Phil was doing a lot of hanging out in Fairfax. Yeah. That's a piece of history too, we won't discuss that. Right. I think, I think we'll just point out that I think they were known as maybe the Heineken years. <laughs> But they were fun. And so, um, so now let's talk a little bit about Big Brown, because as you can see, Big Brown is, is here. So, um, Big, Big Brown made his debut in uh, 1971, and uh, it was, it was, it, it was, it's a guild instrument, but it was um, Alembicize. Alembic, who made Khaleesi, Mother of Dragons, the bass that Phil currently plays. Um, uh, totally retrofitted that, that instrument for him. And, and from 71 through 74, there were a lot of changes because of making it work with the wall of sound. But by 1975, uh, this really was the instrument that Phil played from 75 to 78 until he, I think, got an Irwin guitar was what you played next. Yeah, I think so. Um, so without further ado, Phil is going to show us some things about Big Brown and what all those crazy knobs and pickups do. And because uh, we're all want to know. You sure you really want to know? Yeah. Well, uh, I, 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 uh, this guy just went up to a for a for a kind of a 
tune up and the docu documentation thing they had. They wanted to make sure that they had all the, uh, the records of everything that went in and stuff. And one of the things they gave me that came back with it is a little a little diagram of what all the knobs do in case. I, <laughs> so. Um, Oh, well, this here is master volume. So, you know, it gets louder, it gets quieter. <laughs> this is the main uh, pickup selector switch. It, it gives me, uh, gives me bass on, uh, ba oh, let's see. Consult the diagram. <laughs> so, at the, and this, at this first position, that activates this pickup. These knobs here, these five knobs here are, are to control that pickup. So there's volume, uh, like dry volume with no no effects on it. And there's the uh, uh, the uh, filter volume. Which I, I can point to my to my uh, satisfaction, and you can you can hear that the pickups are picking up magnetic interference. This is just exactly what was happening in the Grateful Dead movie when, when, uh, when I was playing with the camera. So this knob is the frequency, freak the center frequency of the thick of the pickup. This knob is the Q or bandwidth. So that doesn't, it doesn't, it's not that effective. That's not even, that, that lower stuff, that's not even part of the note I'm playing. <laughs> It's almost like a, a wah wah, only you have to use your hand. <laughs> and uh, this switch selects uh, a high pass, low pass, or band pass. So, high pass, high pass. Yes. That gives you the whole sound of the string. And as I lower the frequency, it just gives you kind of percussion or. or That's low pass. So if I turn that all the way up, that's a high. I never used. <laughs> somebody wrote, somebody once wrote on a, you know, not on a blog because they didn't have any in those days, but some kind of review or something. Like that. Uh, Phil has always has like 25 knobs on his bass, and he and he yet it always sounds the same. <laughs> so he's very perceptive of it. Because that's what I did. And the whole deal was set it and forget it. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> what's the deal with the um, copper pickup in the middle there? Oh, that is the infamous quad pickup, <laughs> and we can't. Uh... So that's the pickup that would send an individual string to an individual speaker stack in the wall of sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and th this this switch here, the second switch on the on the bottom uh, horn is. And you notice that the, the uh, quad pickup has a lot of hum in it. They hadn't quite figured out how to make a humbucker quad pickup in 1971. <laughs> but uh, it, uh, this, and this other switch here is, uh, is the, uh, the distribution of the, of the strings. So the, if you think of them as numbers, uh, so uh, one, two, three, four, one, don't sound very different, do I think 
Okay, so this one is pretty clearly, is pretty set up, uh, pretty much set up, so um, the top two strings go somewhere that I don't have plugged in. You know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So there's a, there's a special eight pin adapter on the, on the tailpiece here that um, was apparently made from some sort of machinery from the 1930s. Yeah. And, uh, it's like radio station um, uh, hardware from the 1930s. And it was that eight pin adapter that made the whole wall of sound work. <laughs> no, 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 no. It, was the, it made the quad pickup work. Yeah, I, we talked about this last, uh, last week, I think. Yeah. So, um, I think, uh, is that the full tour of the bass? And, 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 and the, this is the quad volume now. Be before, we, before we put it down, can we just get one big, bad, Phil Lesh bass bomb? Like, you know? Thank <laughs> you. 